Hello and welcome to the main event! Today we explore several different ways 1980s software generated random numbers. For each one, we will explore the code. We will explore how it works. We will assess its actual randomness using a special mathematical technique known as eyeballing it. And then, we will pit them all against each other in a speed test, the likes of which has never been seen before. Who will reign champion? Stay tuned to find out. That's what we in showbiz call a hook. It's a promise that something fascinating is on the way. Will I keep that promise? Keep watching to find out. Before we begin, a big thank you to Glenn Hewlett, the author of the Basic to 6809 compiler. All of the algorithms that you will be seeing were sent to me by him as the product of his research into generating random numbers for his compiler. All right, let's get started with number one. First up, we have the routine I call the simple Eeyore. This is the AI generated routine that I went over in this video, and I went into Lots of detail about everything, about how it works, so I'm not going to redo that all today. But like most random number generators, it makes use of a seed, and that seed will determine what the next random number is. As part of producing that random number, the seed will get changed so that the next time it gets called, the new seed will determine the new next number. In this case, we're simply doing a shift left and an Eeyore with a magic number, with a couple conditional branches to kind of patch over some issues that would otherwise occur if we didn't. And here we can see what it looks like. This range of characters here is what I call the counters. There's 256 of them. Because the routine returns a number between 0 and 255, and I use that number as an offset into this range of counters. So for example, if it returns hex f6, I would offset into hex f6, which is probably somewhere around here. And then whatever character I see there, I just increment it to the next character in the sequence that the video display generator uses. And so when I let it fly, we can kind of see spatially, based on where something changes, what that number was that it just generated. And I can also get the whole gestalt and just look at the whole thing and just get a sense. And if we do that, we'll notice that this is a ridiculously fair and balanced algorithm. The offsets might appear to be chosen at random in some kind of random order, but all of them get a chance to move to one value before any of them will move to the next value. You're never going to see a random number picked twice before every other random number has had their turn. As a result, this is way more predictable than a typical pseudo-random number generator is, and you have to be pretty careful where you apply this. Next up is the 8-bit pseudorandom number generator used in Glenn Hewlett's Basic to 6809 compiler. This routine uses four different bytes worth of seeds. It consists of four steps. This code here increments one of the seeds, I'm calling random x. The next block of code takes seed 1, which is one of the other bytes of seeds, exclusive ors it with the random x we just changed, and another seed random c. The next step adds seed 1 to seed 2, and then that's the new value of seed 2. Finally, we take seed 2, divide it by 2, add to that random c, exclusive or that with seed 1, and that's the new value of random c, which is also the value we return. Well, there's a lot of stuff going on there. What does this look like? Well, this looks to be a lot more random than the first one. It's not nearly as fair, it's not nearly as balanced, but it does appear like everyone does eventually get a turn in a reasonable amount of time. Let's start it over in turbo mode and see what it looks like there. Michael, they're getting away. Now you can get even more of a feel for how it goes over a longer period of time. And again, it's not perfectly fair, it's not perfectly balanced, which is a good thing, but it's pretty fair and pretty balanced. Looks pretty unpredictable. This next one also came from Glenn Hewlett's research. I call it the high period random number generator. 
And the heart of it is this subroutine over here. This is doing some interesting shifts and exclusive ORs, but it's actually quite simple. It's using four bytes worth of seed called rundman, which also just happens to be the same location in memory that the ROMs random number generator routine uses as its random variable seed. And so it takes the full 32 bits of rundman, and it pays attention just to these two bits right here. It exclusive ORs them together, and the result of that bit gets moved into the most significant bit over here. Meanwhile, the most significant bit that used to be there and everything else gets shifted one slot to the right. So really all that's happening is we're shifting all the bits to the right and to figure out what should go here, we exclusive OR these two bits together. The bit positions we choose to exclusive OR together never changes. It's always the 28th and the 31st bit from the left. So that's what's going on in this subroutine. The main body of this random number generator just calls that subroutine five times. Each time it's updating rund man, all 32 bits of it. And in the end, we take the most significant byte and that's our answer. I believe this would qualify as an actual linear feedback shift register algorithm. What's interesting is we're only tapping two bits, just the 28th and the 31st bit from the left. And here's what it looks like. Once again, pretty random, not perfectly fair, fairly fair. Let's speed it up. Yep. I think that looks pretty reasonable. I don't notice any bias. Looks pretty random, not very predictable. The claim is that this does have a period of over 2 million. Really, the largest number you could store in 32 bits is apparently the full period of this. Next up is a totally different way of doing things. This is apparently what Glenn determined was happening inside the game Megabug. The seed for Megabug is these two bytes run seed 0 but it's not really operating like a seed like you would expect. It's more like an offset. Each time into this routine, we take that seed, we add hex 15 to it, and we ensure it's within range. The range will make sense in a second, but the range is to make sure that once we hit one FFFF, we wrap around back to zero again. Now we take that offset that we just calculated, store it back for later use, but importantly, we add it to A1000, which happens to be the address of the beginning of the ROM in the COCO. So what we're really doing is skirting around through the ROM, skipping hex 15 bytes every time. The next couple instructions are just a clever way to dereference into the ROM wherever we were just pointing and to pluck the answer back into B. We take the offset address that we calculated, we push it onto the stack, then we use the stack as an index register to read not the address, but the byte that's pointed to by the address. And at the same time, we just do that plus plus to do the equivalent of a pull, so we restore the stack pointer where it was before. This approach is similar to what other games have done on very low memory system, like Yar's Revenge would use its own code to produce that kind of staticky, noisy region on the screen. So if we let this go for a while, keep your eye around here. You'll see that this character seems to flip much, much, much less than the others. Actually, over here, this one hasn't even flipped at all. Okay, now it's a B. There is a very strong bias against some of these positions, some of these values, than many of the others. Some of these are way ahead. They're already into the semi-graphics region of the character sequence. And this one is still at E, F, still very early in the sequence. Now, of course, you don't want it to be perfectly balanced. You don't want it to be perfectly fair. But at the same time, you don't want a very clear bias. You don't want something that will almost never be selected, whereas something else that's very, very commonly selected. But that's kind of what you should expect to happen when these supposedly random numbers are really just bytes that come from the code of the ROM. Code is a language and languages will naturally have certain things that appear more often than other things. 
Some of these bytes might not even participate in any machine language at all, except possibly for parameters, like addresses or offsets to the real instructions. So this is a clever way to go, and it doesn't need to use a lot of instructions, and it doesn't need to use a lot of memory. But I don't know about the randomness. So let's start over again in turbo mode and see if this pattern becomes more apparent. Very quickly, we can see everyone is, has done to the, uh, out, out of the inverted characters except for a few places. Then as it continues, everyone kind of gets to cycle around all the way to the end while others are just still in the very early stages. Next, we move into the 16-bit random number generators. These are routines where each call will bring back two random bytes instead of just one. And we're starting off with simple EOR16. This is the same as the simple EOR routine, except I just extended it to 16 bits. You can see some more details about that in this video. And when we run it, it, it does actually appear more random than the 8-bit version of the routine. Certainly not as fair. Certainly not as predictable. And this is likely due to the fact that we have a 16-bit seed instead of just an 8-bit seed. But we still only have 256 counters. So whatever pattern there is or whatever period it has is going to be longer. And it will be harder to figure out that pattern visually by just looking at 256 counters. But I still give it points for being kind of random. You'll notice, by the way, this time, whatever random number gets returned is not going to have the high byte just 0, 0 like everything else. We're going to be taking this byte and incrementing the counter at that offset, B0. We'll also take this byte, D6, and increment the counter at that offset as well. You'll also see that the number of calls, just to keep things even, goes up by 2 each time, so that when we do the speed test and we compare the number of calls that were made in a given unit of time, the 16-bit algorithms are going to get a bit more credit. They're going to go up by two calls each time because they're getting back two random bytes each time. And finally, we'll be testing the ROM routine that generates random numbers as is built into Color Basic. We simply set up the floating point accumulators, which are its parameter. We call into the routine, and we grab back out Mantissa bytes two and three. I go into a huge amount of detail about how all of this works in this video, which steps through the R&D routine itself to show exactly how it works, and also in this video where I figure out how to get two bytes instead of just one on each call. And again, since this is getting back 16 bits at a time, the random number returned is going to have all of the bytes set, both of them, and the number of calls is going to go up by two each time. And if we let it fly, as we've seen in previous videos, it's pretty doggone random. And if we speed it up, it's pretty doggone random. We may be paying a performance price, though, due to all of those floating point operations that it's doing. And now it is time for a head to head to head to head to head to head speed test. The rules are simple. We will start the algorithms at the same time. And the first to generate 65,536 random bytes is the winner. That is when this number of calls counter wraps back around to zero. The algorithms are running at regular speed, no turbo boost. This ensures that the cycle counts are as accurate as the emulator is capable of doing. On your marks, get set, go. And they're off. Who will be the fastest? And who cares? Will generating two bytes instead of one on each call prove to be an asset or a liability for the bottom two? Will Megabug's lack of randomness prove to help it as it avoids doing math and simply indexes through the ROM? Simple EOR16 appears to be in the lead. Will it be able to keep its advantage? Oh, and in a stunning victory, Simple EOR16 completes in just 47 seconds and 27 frames.
simple Eeyore, basic to 6809 8-bit and Megabug complete within just seconds of each other. It's now on a race to the bottom between High Period and the ROM. And there you have it, High Period completes in 1 minute and 51 seconds. The only question now is how much longer it will take ROM than everybody else. This is ROM's first qualifying round in the Random Number Generation Olympics. ROM has a deep history with roots in random number generators from prior retro microcomputer basic ROMs. Its linear congruential generator is hampered by its reliance on the slow software floating point accumulators, but its randomness is undeniable. ROM has said that winning this contest would bring it great satisfaction but not nearly as much satisfaction as making basic programming accessible to generations of programmers. And there we go, Rom has finished in a humiliating 2 minutes, 33 seconds, and 28 frames defeat. Speed is definitely not its forte, but you have to hand it to Rom. It is always there. If you would like to explore the code, all the different algorithms and the test harness are available for download. Check the link in the description.